First off, welcome. If you're online watching us, welcome. And because I watched a lot of videos with my kids, I think I'm supposed to say, if you like watching us online, hit like and subscribe. Because that's what I hear all the time. So first off, there was a cell phone dropped in the parking lot. If you're missing your cell phone, please see Will. He will have it in his hand, not mine. And I'd like to invite Kelly and some babies up here. Parents, please bring your babies. They can't walk. This weekend so that I don't have to do this but Will and Eric generously gave us babies this year so I told them fine I'll do it um, so we're gonna have all the new babies this year join us first up we have oh Miss Charlotte welcome come over <laughs> so Charlotte had a new baby brother this year this is Miles and his parents Eric and Jillian and big sister Charlotte and then we also had Miss Mabry her parents Matt and Angela and big sister Ayla come on Ayla join the party and stage this side we have Will and Hannah and big baby Graham hi Graham hi Graham and then also I was gonna ask uh, miss Linda Johnson I know you're here um, come on up Linda and buddy so Linda and buddy welcomed a great grandson just on December 28th and y'all have probably seen little Marcy around here. She's, I think, three and a half years old. Um, and so it's her little brother. So they're not here today, but I asked that um, they would join us. So one of the missions that we have the privilege to support here with your donations is the Pregnancy Resource Center of Richmond. Um, and so today we celebrate Sanctity of Life Sunday. Um, we support their mission, and we also welcome all of our new babies. So we have a pledge for the parents. Um, usually we would print this out for you all, but I'm confident you can remember the words. We will. Got it. All right, we will. So we're going to do that for them first. Do you, as parents of these children, pledge to be an example to them, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord, and to love and to cherish them as a gift from God? We will. And to our congregation, same thing. Do you pledge your support to these families? Will you encourage them, pray for them, and assist them in the godly training of these little ones? Oh, thank you. I think it also comes as no surprise why I uh, rendered my retirement last week. <laughs> this next generation is, whoo! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. These are some of my favorite people up here. And I know they're going to do great things. So will you join me as we pray for them? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. Um, we thank you for these families and for the babies and for what they mean to our church here. Um, would you be with these parents as they raise these kids? Um, give them wisdom, give them lots of patience, give them the right words and the right, the right knowledge at the right time. And would you be with us as their friends and their family to guide them and to help them and to lead them on the way. Uh, be with us now as we go into a time of worship. Um, may all we do be glorified to you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, wait, I have gifts. Sorry, I have gifts. All right, thank you, Kelly, and welcome, babies. Uh, and if you guys would stand, and we'll start our worship.
defender.
Jesus, we're going to come to you in a word of prayer, Lord God, as we prepare for our message. Thank you, Jesus, for defending us when we don't deserve it. Thank you for always picking up our pieces. Lord God, I pray over Will today as he brings the message, Lord Jesus, that you will just open up our hearts. You will help us to remember the God we serve, Lord Jesus, and you will help us to realize that we're going to leave this place better than we came. I thank you, Lord Heavenly Father, for the victory that our people are going to have today, Lord God, that your people are going to have today. Lord Jesus, as we truly bow down, stay still, and worship you with everything we've got. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, good morning, church. My name is Will Pinnell. I'm the senior minister here at MCC, and it is just an honor to be with you this morning, to see you guys in person, that you guys are online choosing to worship with us also. We are just thrilled. If this is your first time in person or online, or if you're new and you want to get plugged in, you want to get some more information about MCC as a whole, I just want to encourage you to text the word welcome to the phone number that should be on the screens right there. Step out of the way so you can see that. Because um, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to just say, hey, we would say, love to say thank you for joining us in worship. Um, and if you're interested in a life group or serving here in the church or in the community, we just would love to give you that opportunity to connect with us um, and for us to answer any questions and help get you plugged in. Let me ask you guys a question this morning. Have you ever been at a place where you intended to do something and didn't? Like you intended to do the project at work but you just got too busy or for, forgot. Let me ask you, how many times does your good intentions make up for your lack of doing the thing you intended to do? Never? Zero? Earlier last week on Monday, I wanted to just be sweet, be a nice husband, and leave a note for Hannah on the table on my way out the door to work. And I got to work about an hour into my day, and I was like, dang it, I forgot. I was like, it's okay, it's okay. I still have Tuesday. I'll set a reminder on my phone to do it. And the reminder went off. I got in the shower and got out. And sometime between the shower and getting dressed and getting ready to go to work, I ended up at work thinking, dang it, I forgot again. It's like, it's okay. I have one more day. We were leaving Wednesday evening. I was like, I have one more day to leave a note before uh, I go to the office to work this morning. You want to guess what happened? (laughs) Yeah, I forgot a third time in a row. (laughs) I could have come home and said, hey, babe, wasn't it great that I intended to leave you a note? Wasn't it great that I intended to buy you flowers? But we all know that you don't get credit for what you intend to do. Oh, and by the way, men, just as a quick reminder, you know, Valentine's Day, same day it was last year, February 14th. It's less than a month away. Don't let it sneak up on you. Even if she says you don't have to do anything or don't have to do much, do something, right? Amen? Okay. All right, now you guys are going to blame me when, uh, women, you're going to point to me in this time when your husband still forget. But anyway, intentions don't mean anything if we don't actually follow through with it. And this is the thought that I kept coming back to over and over this week as I, as I studied the text in Judges chapter 4. We're in the middle of this series called Broken Heroes, looking at the book of Judges, and what we're seeing is how God has used broken people to save his people. He's used broken people as judges to come and rescue his people out of oppression. We see throughout the book of Judges this cycle, a cycle of Israel being right with God, and then them sinning, and then them being oppressed by a foreign nation, and them crying out to God, and God sending a judge, and the the judge freeing them from oppression, and them being right with God again. And this cycle continues over and over and over again. And in Judges chapter 4, we see the beginnings of this cycle start to happen again. Judges chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And this time, God sent Jabin, king of Canaan, who had 900 chariots of iron. And as we talked about a couple weeks ago, these chariots of iron were the biggest, baddest military invention weapon of this, to- of this time. If you had chariots of iron, you ruled all when it came to, to military and, and ruling in your area. That These were the greatest ever. And in verse 3, it says that, that he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. For 20 years. Verse 4 continues, and now Deborah, a prophetess. The wife of Lapidus was judging Israel at this time. Here we have the the only judge who's a woman judging over Israel. And and people bring her cases. She judges just between them. She has this title of prophet or prophetess because she's a woman. And and she gets this vision, this knowledge from God because of her position, because of her giftedness, that Barak 
is supposed to be, uh, supposed to be leading the nation of Israel against Jabin, against Sisera, the commander of the army. And so she calls for Barak, and she says, verses 6 and 7, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you to go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon and with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hands. So, so where are you, Barak? Barak, you've been called. We don't know what kind of time has gone by, but, but God has asked you to do this. So why haven't you done it? Well, I, um, I intended to, and I overslept last Tuesday when I was supposed to do that. Um, I, I meant to do that. I really did, I promise, but I just haven't got around to it yet. Th- these are just excuses I imagine him making up. But in verse 8, he, he just comes out and he says, If you will not go with me, or if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. In other words, if you don't go with me, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to do what God has asked me to do. And she replies in verse 9, she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead you to glory. For the Lord will sell sister into the hand of a woman. And then we have this very strange, out-of-the-place verse that almost makes no sense at all. Verse 11 says, Now Heber, the Canaanite, had separated from the Canaanites, the descendant of Hobor, Hobab. These names are, are strange names. If you mess up with them, I do too, often. Uh, the father-in-law of Moses, and he had pitched his tent as far away as the oak and Zananim, which is near Kadesh. This very strange verse is we're talking about the, the battle, the war that Barak is supposed to go against uh, Jabin, the king of, of Canaan. This very strange verse about a tent in the middle of nowhere. And so Barak finally does what he is supposed to do, what God has called him to do, and he, he gathers the troops and he goes down to the river, a strange place to, to mount an attack. But what we see in, ver- in chapter 5 is, is Deborah's song, her, her celebration of what God has done, how God has brought victory. And then there's this little place in verse 4 that talks about the rain coming. Now, if Sisera was a good general, if, if Jabin was a wise king, he would not have sent the chariots of iron into battle during a wet season. Most scholars and commentators suspect that this was the dry season where it didn't rain. It would have been highly unusual for any rain to have come, but God sent rain, which then raised the waters of the river and made that whole area marsh and muddy. And what do you think happens to chariots of iron when it's muddy outside? They don't do so good. And then suddenly Jabin's greatest asset becomes his greatest weakness. His greatest advantage in these chariots of iron suddenly becomes his greatest disadvantage, and the whole army is thrown off. The the chariots are are massive paperweights, and and the whole army starts to flee. uh, Sisera starts to flee, and he comes across this tent in the middle of nowhere, and Jael, the wife, comes out and says, hey, come take rest here. I'll look after you. Gives him water. He lays down to take a nap. And in verse 21, it says, But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. I don't mean to be gross again by this, but this is just what the Word of God says. And and this is exciting stuff, right? This is vicious. And this is crazy because we don't think about women really being military leaders, leading the charge. But we see Barrett coming, chasing Sisera, and this woman coming out saying, I, I think I have in here what you're looking for. And Barrett continues the, the, the Israelite army, and they are released from oppression. They, they overtake Jabin and his army, and the rest, then has rest for 40 years. And there's two key things that I want to point out from this text that we see surrounding our two main characters of Deborah and Barak. And the first one that I want to start with is that God has gifted women for leadership roles in the church. When we look at Deborah, we look that God has appointed her as a prophet, appointed her as a judge, and and we see these are roles typically held by men, but God has appointed her and gifted her for these leadership roles in the church. And for some reason, 
We in the modern church today across America have told women for years they can't serve and they can't use their gifts that God has given them in the church. Because I I don't know where we find this in Scripture, but sometimes we're under this impression that God has given men these kinds of gifts over here and women these gifts over here. But when we look in the New Testament, when we see the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives people, it's always, here are the gifts of the Spirit. Here's what comes from the Spirit. And it doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Nowhere in the text does God say, to men I give the gift of leadership, to women I give the gift of cooking. Now, I may make a joke like that at the house just to get a reaction out of Hannah, but nowhere in Scripture do we find this. Nowhere in Scripture do we say, men, you have the gift of wisdom. Women, you have the gift of making clothes clean. It's just not there. If there is ever a place to find it, I think it would be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul says, now, there are a variety of gifts. Now, here it would be. There are a variety of gifts, and, and to, to men I give this, to women I give these, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of service. Here, here we go again. To, to men I, I charge to do this, to women I charge to do this, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities. It is the same God who empowers them all to everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There's no differentiation of gifts. Women, you have been given gifts of leadership. You've been given gifts of teaching, given gifts of compassion, of mercy. The same gifts that we see the Holy Spirit giving to people, you have access to also. And yet in the church, I've been a part of churches, and I've heard from other pastors, the, the many churches that they've been a part of, that there are churches across America, across the world, where you can teach a, a woman can teach a middle school class for the Sunday school hour, but not the middle school class for the worship hour. For 10 o'clock, for, for Sunday school, for life groups, it's one thing, but for worship, it, it's totally different. I've been a part of churches where women can teach in life groups and in Sunday school classes, but not up here on the stage during worship. Or they can be up here on the stage, but it has to be like a women's conference or a parenting conference or a marriage conference, but not during worship. Or it can be during worship, but it has to be over at the church camp where it's all youth and not during worship. And we've drawn these lines, these arbitrary man-made lines between what women can do and can't do. Anyone who knows my wife knows that I did not marry a timid, quiet, reserved woman in the least. She is wise, she is passionate, she is spiritually mature and spiritually wise. And I say all of that with the greatest amount of love. And if we ever are blessed to raise a daughter in this world, I want her to know these stories about Deborah I want her to know that the Spirit has gifted her and that she should lean into and use the gifts that God has given her in this world. Now, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, in a couple weeks, we ha- or a couple months at this point, I think, uh, we, we have a, a sermon series coming up. We're going to talk about the role of an elder, the role of a deacon, the, the role of a church member, and the role of a Christian. And, and what we believe here in the church, what I believe, is that this role of an elder to lead the local church is a role that, that biblically points back to the created order of Adam being created first and then Eve. And this role of an elder, of leading in the church, is the one singular role that God has reserved for men. But besides this role of an elder, women, we need you to use the gifts that God has given you in this church and in the church of Big C and God's church. We need you to use these gifts. God has gifted you. Your family needs you to use these gifts. The church needs you to use these gifts. Men, we need our women to use the gifts that God has given them. And that's what we see from the life of Deborah. From the life of Barak, what we see is that when men fail to lead, people suffer. I don't know how long it was before uh, Deborah called Barak on this this, this call from God to go and lead the men into battle. It could have been a day, could have been a week, could have been a month. But there was a period of time where Jabin was, was treating Israel with extreme cruelty. 
And Barak did nothing. Barak sat on the sideline. Barak was called by God to go free his people, and he did nothing. So in a very literal sense, when men fail to lead, people suffer. And we see this in the church. We see this in families, that when men fail to lead, people suffer. Now, don't get me wrong. We have some amazing men in this church who lead with strength, who lead with confidence, who lead with the gifting that God has given them. We have some amazing leaders in this church. We also have a lot of men who aren't even in the game. We have a lot of men who aren't, aren't even here. So I'm not even going to address them because they're not even here. We have a lot of men here who think that showing up on Sunday mornings just automatically leads to spiritual maturity, automatically leads to spiritual wisdom, but let me ask you a question. If you go to a gym once a week, is that enough to get into shape? It matters what you do between visits. And I think most personal trainers would tell you, you have to go more than just once a week. And men, it is time that we get off our butts and get in the game. Because there is some spiritual warfare happening around us. And we have got to take charge and take lead and lead our families and lead the church into battle. And chapter 5, as Deborah's recounting everything that's happened in this war, there's this verse 17 where she talks about uh, different people who, who weren't even in the battle. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did you stay with the ships? Asher still sat on the coast of the sea, staying by, by, uh, by his landings. They're back at the, at the, on the beach, kicking up their feet, relaxing when everyone else is at war. Why are they staying back? Men, why are we staying back by the ships when it is time for us to lead? Because when we don't lead, people suffer. We see this even in the beginning of creation. We see this as Adam and Eve are in the garden together and Satan comes to Eve. And she tempts, uh, he tempts Eve as Satan comes and attacks and says, Hey, this fruit that God told you not to eat from, it's really okay for eating. It's okay that you eat this. God just doesn't want you to be wise like he is and comes up with all these excuses. And where's Adam? Where's Adam? Chapter 3 of Genesis in verse 6 tells us where Adam was. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was the light to the eyes and that the tree looked to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. He wasn't just off somewhere. Satan didn't find her in a moment of weakness without Adam there. He was standing back. He was seeing all this happen. He was hearing it happen, and he just, he just stood back. When he should have stepped in front of us, I, I, I got this. No, 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 no. You will not attack us. You will not lie to us about who, what God said, who God is. You will not lie to us and attack my wife like that. He should have stepped into the fight, but instead he hung back by the ships. And men, we have got to get in the game. We've got to get in this fight. Over in the New Testament, uh, there's a couple passages that talk about uh, Eve sinning first, that she ate first, and then Adam. But to me, the definitive response, the definitive um, answer to what really happened here in Genesis is in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death, sin, came into this world through one man. Paul holds Adam responsible. As I said earlier, we, uh, we believe here that this role of eldership in the church is reserved for, for men to lead in the church. As we look in scripture, we see that men have been called by God to lead their families. And sometimes I think we get this idea of what leadership is a little confused. Because if you come to our elders meeting, there's barely a meeting that goes by that we don't ask the question, hey, have we asked our wives what they think? There's barely a meeting that goes by that says, hey, we, we might need to pray about this a little bit more and see what our wives think. Because we recognize the gifts and the wisdom that God has given to our wives. The leadership that, that 
that God has put on men to lead as elders and the head of the household is that if something, I'm sorry, when something goes wrong, there isn't a guy in the room that we call an elder here at MCC that would go back to his wife and say, because you told us to make this call, you see how it went? There is not a man in that room that would say it's your fault to his wife that we're in this place we are because it was your, your call, because you gave me this advice. And men, I hope I never hear you say that to your wives either. I hope you get their input. I hope you, you see what your wife has to think, especially about big family decisions. But the weight of leadership, of making the decision regardless of the outcome, is on our shoulders. I firmly believe that one day I will have to stand before God and give an account for my actions, for my words, for my thoughts. My wife will have to do the same for her. My son is going to have to do the same for him and any other children that we have. They have to stand on their own. But there's going to be an extra question to me. How did you lead your family? How did you lead the church as an elder? There's going to be extra weight an extra responsibility on my shoulders because of how I lead my family. So men, we need you to lead. We need you to get off the shore, away from the ships, and get in this fight. And amazing things will happen when you do. Statistics back it up that when men get involved in the church, when men get involved in leading their families, powerful and amazing things happen. Women, parents, and moms, if you come to church, if moms come to church, there's a 17% chance that their family comes with them. Husbands, fathers, if you come to church, there's a 93% chance that your families come with you. 93%. Moms, if you're involved in a life group or a Sunday school class, there's a 15% chance that your kids, when they're grown, will be a part of a, of a life group or Sunday school class. Men, fathers, if you're part of a Sunday school class or life group, there's a 55% chance that when your kids are grown, they will be part of a life group also. And we know the benefits of that. We know the benefits of being in a small community where you can dive deep with with your relationship with God and share the burdens and and struggles and life together. We know the benefits of that. And and the, the, the stats just, they're there. They back this up that, men, we need you involved. This isn't a men versus woman thing because if we can, if we can get this marriage thing together, the way God has called us to be one in marriage and do it together, if both the mom and dad are involved in a life group, there's a 72% chance that your kids will be involved in a life group when they're grown. Women, we need you to lean into the gifting that God has given you in this church and in your family. Men, we need you to lead and take this this biblical, spiritual responsibility of leadership on your shoulders. Some of you have have just not done that. But I want you to know that it's not too late. Hebrews chapter 11 is is what we refer to as the Hall of Faith chapter. And in this chapter, uh, the author lists so many people in the Old Testament scriptures who, by faith, God worked mighty things through. And in chapter 11, verse 32, it says, And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stepped, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Man, we need you. And like Barak, it's not too late for you to step up and be the spiritual leaders in your family that God has called you to be. Last week, we talked about weakness and leaning into our weakness and allowing God's strength to be known through our weaknesses. And there is a time for that. There's also a time to lean into our strengths and lean into the giftings that God has given us through his spirit. 
Men, we need you. Women, we need you. Women, we need you to encourage your husbands. Husbands, we need to encourage you to stand up and to start fighting in this battle. We need you to pray with your wives. We need you to pray with your children. We need you to read scripture with your wives. We need you to read scripture with your children. We need you to deepen your spiritual life so that you can pour into your family and pour into the church here. And the church of Big C is not just about us. We are just such a small part of what God is doing in this world and in his kingdom. And the church, Big C, needs you to be the spiritual leaders that he's called you to be. A couple weeks ago, I had a good friend of mine text me and send me a copy of, um, or a link to a Bible on Amazon. And he said, hey, what do you think about this? I need to get deeper in my spiritual life. I need to get back to reading on a regular basis. And, and what, what do you think about this, this Bible? I said, man, the, the commentary at the bottom does not matter. Translation does not matter. What matters is you getting in this fight. What matters is you getting in the word. What matters is you taking your faith seriously. What matters is you being the spiritual leader that your family needs. Looks like a great Bible. But intentions to grow in our faith, intentions to read the word, intentions to lead our family, intentions to use our strengths, intentions to get in this fight, they're meaningless unless we actually do. God, we, we come to you and we beg for your forgiveness and grace for the ways that we have not used the gifts you have given us. God, we beg for your forgiveness for the ways we have hindered others in using their gifts that you have given them. God, we beg for your forgiveness in the ways that we have not gotten in this fight, that we have hung back by the ships, that we're relaxing on the shore. God, I, we apologize and we ask for your forgiveness and grace in the ways that we have let Satan attack our, our wives and our family and we haven't done anything about it. God, I pray for the women in this room that they can lean into the gifting that you have given them, the gift of mercy, the gift of compassion, the gift of teaching, the gift of wisdom, the gift, whatever gift that you have given them. God, I pray that they will lean into the gift that you have given them. And Father, for the men in this room, I pray that they lean in to the leadership roles you have called them to be, that they lead, lean into leading their families, their marriages, and the church. God, we apologize. And we look to you for strength and wisdom moving forward. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're, um, we're going to pause in this moment to take communion together. Uh, we're going to pause in this moment, and there's, there's communion on the table to the side. If you're joining us online, I want to encourage you to, to grab a loaf of bread or a piece of bread and, and something to drink and, and men from home, I encourage you to, to you step up in this moment and, and go get what your family needs to take communion in this moment. But when Jesus went to the cross, when he died and defeated death, he did not do that so that we sit idly by, male or female. He did that to give us power. He did that to give us strength. He did that so that his spirit can come inside of us and empower us and give us gifts and give us strength to do what he has called us to do. Father God, we thank you for the ways that you have gifted us all. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood, for the mess, for the torture, for the pain that it was for you to witness and for you to be on that cross. And we thank you for the life that it brings us. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
coming to the end of our service where we're gonna have one more opportunity to worship our Savior. So we're gonna ask you all to stand with us and sing, but I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip, if you've ever gone to a camp, but we come back on fire for God. We come back ready to serve, ready to lean into those spiritual gifts, ready to lead. And we're hoping that today what we can leave you with is that we're gonna usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit here because that's what it does to us. That's what creates that sensation inside of us when we come back from these incredible opportunities. The Holy Spirit is tangible there and we have access to that at all times. So we're gonna ask that you stand with us, that you worship with us and that you welcome the Holy Spirit into this place so that we can all go into our community where we have the opportunity to make a difference filled with the Holy Spirit, with his presence this week. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're Shame is a
awesome. Hey, just a couple of things real quick. Um, we, we, need, we need you. The church needs you to be serving. Um, if you'd like to get plugged in, serving in our youth ministry, children's ministry, serving um, in another role, or just want to get plugged in more, I encourage you to reach out to me this week. Um, men, if you need ideas or want ideas about spiritually leading in your home, in your household, or in the church, I encourage you to reach out to me. I'd be glad um, to talk with anybody about, about any of this stuff. Um, we are just so glad that you guys are here to worship with us. Um, we hope that you have a, an amazing week, um, and we hope to see you next week. Let's, uh, let's pray to dismiss. Father God, I ask for your blessing uh, upon these people as, as they leave either our, our Um, our our building here or leave worship from at home. God, I pray your blessing over them as they lean into the giftings that you have given them, as they lean into leadership. God, I pray that you just bless our efforts this week and what we do to bring people to you and to be a light in this world. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a good week.